Okay. Yeah. So just let me know once you're able to see my screen. Yes, I'm able to see. Okay, perfect. So finally, we are starting off with the very first chapter that is number systems. Uh, first, the pattern would be that we'll be discussing the contents and then we are going to discuss the past paper questions which are related to... How many chapters do we have to do? I told everything yesterday. Uh, there are 25 chapters, okay? okay? Right. So let's get started. Okay, so um, this table is basically uh, the table of numbers which you have been seeing like since grade 5. All these numbers are real numbers, first thing. And the other thing is that you guys already have a rough idea about these, okay? So like the very first set is set of natural numbers in which we have one, two, three, and so on. So in natural numbers, we do not have zero. We do not have any negative number. We only have positive integers and begins with one, okay? So we are clear about natural numbers, okay? If you guys have to ask me anything, stop me there and then and ask me, right? Okay. Then for the second one, the second set is the set of whole numbers. In whole numbers, we have all the positive integers as well as zero as well, okay? So like in natural numbers, we only have positive integers. And in whole numbers, we have zero plus positive integers, okay? Right. If I talk about set of integers, obviously we have positive, negative integers, both of them, and we have zero as well. Okay, if I talk about set of positive integers only, obviously I'm going to have positive integers only, like it would begin with one, then we have all the positive integers in the set. And so far we're talking about whole numbers, okay? You guys uh, cannot see any decimal, any fraction here, so these are whole numbers, right? If I talk about negative integers, clearly I have all the negative integers in this set. I have minus one, minus two, and so on. Odd numbers, one, three, five, seven, so on. All the odd numbers. Even numbers, we have zero, two, four, right? That's quite self-explanatory. But in this part, just know that zero is the even number. Students at times, they just mess up with the zero. Zero is an even number. Just know that, okay? If we talk about prime numbers, so... Do you guys know what prime numbers are? Okay, so prime number is a number which has two factors only, one and number itself, right? So let's I talk about 11. I can divide 11 by 11 and one only, right? So one factor is number itself and the other factor is one. This applies on every prime number, so this is what we have for, for prime numbers, okay? Is this clear? No, yes, maybe, please answer me. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yes. Okay. Right, so, like, we had idea about positive integers, negative, odd, even, all of that, right? But this part right here is important, okay? These two things are very important, okay? Now let's talk about rational numbers. Rational number basically has all the x's such that x equals p by q, p is the numerator, q is the denominator, and this p and q, they belong to integers, right? So, in short, rational number is basically a number which can be written as a fraction. In the numerator, you have p, that is an integer. In the denominator, you again have um, an integer. But the only thing which you need to know is that obviously, denominator cannot be zero because let's say if you have three by zero or if you have four by zero, these are undefined forms, right? Since these are undefined forms, so whenever we have a fraction, we clearly mentioned this thing that the denominator cannot be zero. So don't get confused. Just know a rational number is a fraction where in numerator and denominator you have integer, okay? Other details would be discussed in next table, okay? And if we talk about irrational numbers, clearly irrational numbers look at the sign right here. It is basically the complement of this Q, right? If this Q right here has fractions, 
then this q dash is going to have like it is not going to have in fact it is not going to have fractions okay so it is going to have all the x's such that x is not a fraction i hope it's clear and when we talk about real numbers we simply combine both rational and irrational numbers right so far you only know that in maths we have different sets we have integers some are positive some are negative some are odd some are even some are prime we know that perfect new thing is rational and irrational you still must be having a bit of an idea about this part as well but now you have your formal definition rational number is a number which can be written as a fraction like this one and irrational number is a number which can not be written as a fraction right and when we talk about real numbers in mathematics every real number basically is this set every real number is um, is the union of these two sets right so in real numbers you will either have rational numbers or irrational numbers i hope it's clear now okay Emma, are you with us? Yes. Okay. Please, um, you know, you guys have to respond whenever I ask you because otherwise I would not be able to, you know, continue. I ask time and mm -hmm. again just so I know that you guys are there. Okay. Right. Okay. Now we have uh, another table, and then we'll move to the whiteboard. Right. Now in this case, okay, and then another thing about. Uh, these classes would be that you will get to see too many properties you will get to see tables because this is something which you guys have not studied in a levels and a levels and o levels things are very conceptual we don't get into these nitty gritties we don't discuss theorems properties but for these test preparations you guys must be familiar with all this content okay right now we have terminating decimals okay so it is quite self explanatory a decimal having finite number of digits in its decimal part terminating means that there would be a point after this decimal where our numbers are going to stop right and the opposite of terminating is non terminating like in non terminating we are going to go on like if we have 3.1452 we will keep on going like this so on and this is not going to terminate but in terminating case there would be a point when we end up like in this case we're ending up at 3 here the last number is 9 at least it's terminating although the number after this decimal is a big number but it is going to terminate at a point right but in non terminating it is never ever going to terminate okay right why are we discussing this you will get to know that shortly okay now let's talk about recurring decimals recurring decimal is basically a decimal in which one or more digits repeat indefinitely right now let's talk about this number right here here you can see that point 13 is being repeated continuously and it's going on like it's not terminating it is non terminating case but it is recurring right so we can write it somehow in a uh, terminating way like we have written 3.13 with a dash on it this dash basically means that we have one three till infinity right this basically means that we are going to have 3.131313 and so on right let's talk about this number right here in this number we can see that 1 to 1 is being repeated right so i can write this number in a terminating manner as well in this way right so this would mean that this 1 to 1 is uh, repeating indefinitely right so so far we know two things terminating and recurring right terminating basically is that the decimal a number after decimal would stop either after 10 decimal places 1000 decimal places but it is going to stop non terminating means it is never ever going to stop and recurring means it is a case of non terminating like you have 13131313 which is going to come continuously 
but it can be written as this so we can consider it non terminate uh, terminating as well right this is non terminating it is going on continuously but if i talk about this number right here i've written this big number in this way so this is somewhat terminating okay right so we have discussed terminating non terminating and recurring right recurring is also called periodic decimals but you'll uh, see recurring more frequently okay so we have discussed these three things but now let's see that why have we even discussed this okay so we have been talking about this because we need to define irrational and rational numbers in details when we discussed rational and irrational numbers over here the only thing i told you guys is that rational numbers are numbers which can be written as fraction and irrational numbers are numbers which cannot be written as a fraction right but now when we look at this part this part is saying that for irrational numbers now these two definitions have nothing to do with fractions that is something that is a way through which we define the questions are not going to be this straightforward that they give you 3 by 4 and they ask you if this is rational or irrational obviously it is rational because it is a fraction but they are not going to ask you things this way you need to know that whenever you have non terminating and non recurring this number right non terminating means after this decimal we are going on continuously and there's no stop it is not going to terminate so this means that this is irrational number it is irrational number okay and if it's non recurring now again we have 1 4 1 5 9 numbers are different so again this is also irrational so one thing which you know is that if x is irrational it cannot be a fraction okay we know that perfect another thing which which you need to know is that it is going to be non terminating after the decimal part you are not going to stop and the second thing is that it is going to be non recurring right so this part would not be recurring numbers would be different and the third thing is that if you have like you know you will get to see questions where they ask you to choose uh, irrational numbers right so what if you have like different options and one of the options is 2n since n is a prime number you will say that yes this is an irrational number okay so like you know by now irrational numbers have non terminating decimal non recurring and under root n type of a thing okay now in under root n there is no decimal but still you should know if n is a prime number it certainly is going to be irrational so we are done with the discussion on irrational let's talk about rational rational is going to have terminating if something is written as 0.78 or let's say we have 0.25 we know that 0.25 is basically 1 by 4 right so this is going to be rational number again if we have recurring now recurring is non terminating we know that like look it is non terminating it is not stopping but since this 4 24 is being repeated we can write it this way as well so we consider it as a rational number right so are you guys clear with irrational and rational numbers yes okay excellent and asad what about you asad are you there okay i have a question yes Yes. Uh, after the last four, there are uh, you know dots, which means that this number is still going on. So it it is non-terminating that there is no boundary. So why is it stated as terminating? No way. Wait, which wait, wait, wait. This terminating? This the this? rational numbers. Yeah. Yeah. The example in the rational numbers. Okay. Four, two, uh, this one. This one. Oh, okay. Excellent. Very good question. This is what I told you. So this basically is. recurring you are very right although this number is non terminating it is not stopping it is going the one on... of the conditions true yeah the okay. two conditions for a rational number right yeah if yeah one of, if one of them is true then yeah. it is a rational number no 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 i i'll tell you i'll tell you listen i'll tell you 
the thing is yeah, that yes certainly definitely either the number is terminating or the number is recurring yes you are right so if either one is true the number is going to be a rational number but here in 4.424 this is non terminating but yes you are right since it is recurring so it is a rational number yes you are right very good okay is it clear now okay excellent yes. okay okay perfect okay now we are going to discuss something which we have been doing but we have never termed that right like we have been multiplying terms we have been taking square roots uh, we have been applying different trigonometric uh, functions like sine cos we have been taking derivatives integration but in a levels we don't talk about definitions right we don't um name thing we just practice things we just focus on concepts so here you will see properties you will see definitions which are used in uh, you know uh, tests as well okay that is part of the syllabus as well okay now here they are talking about two operations unary operations and binary operations it is very easy you'll get to know that in two minutes okay so unary operation an operation which converts one number into another okay let's talk about square root so if i have under root 25 now square root is a unary operation because it is converting this number 25 into 5 let's talk about trigonometric function right so if i say <coughs> i have sin 90 and if we talk about the graph of sin it goes like this right this is 180 and this is 90 and this part is 45 so clearly sin 90 is zero right is this part clear wait just give me a second This is sorry. This is one. This is ninety. Yeah, it's one. It's one. It's not zero. It's one. Okay. So, but here we are not discussing sine cos. Here, the thing which we are discussing is that unary operation is an operation which basically converts one number into another. Right. So, like first we discussed square root. It is converting twenty five to five. So, it is a unary operation. then we are discussing sin it is a trigonometric um, operation which basically is converting 90 degrees to 1 right so clearly uh, and you know why sin 90 is 1 right i mix this up because of sin and cos but yes if we talk about the graph of sin through here i can see this would be 90 and this is 1 this is why sin 90 is 1 okay is this clear Yes. Okay. Excellent. And then, like we have been discussing derivatives and integration as well, so let's not talk about that. So far, you know, unary operation is any operation which is converting one number into another. Okay. Perfect. Right. Now we have binary operation. Binary operation. An operation which converts two numbers into third. Okay. So a rule denoted by a static in a set S. that assigns to any pair of elements of s taken in a definite order to another element of s okay now this definition is very complicated although uh, it is very simple thing i'll tell you how so we are clear with binary operation in binary operation we just have one number and the operation is being applied on that number and it is converted into another number perfect but in unary uh, in binary operation you will have two numbers let's say you will have a and you will have b and this is the operation uh, which we are saying binary operation this static is denoting the binary operation it could be addition it could be multiplication it could be division subtraction but the important thing is in this case we have a set and the important thing is that this a and b should belong to the set s and the third number which you get 
after applying this operation should also belong to this set for example let's talk about let's talk about sets and let's talk about the set of let's say natural numbers okay so this is the set of natural numbers here we have 1 2 3 so on let's talk about this okay i'll write that in that part let's talk about the set of natural numbers which is starting from 1 we have 2 3 and so on right okay and let's talk about negative let's talk about subtraction okay let's see if we can uh, have the binary operation of subtraction in the set of natural numbers or not okay so let's say i take a as 2 and i take b as 3 so what am i going to do a static b now this static is not multiplication this static could be addition multiplication division subtraction it could be any binary operation right here i'm saying my binary operation is subtraction and I'm checking this out if this can hold or not, okay? So I will write down, I'm going to write down A. A is 2, static, that is minus B, that is 3. I'm basically doing this, okay? And this equals minus 1. So this does not belong to N. However, if we look at the definition in this part, a rule denoted by static in a set S that assigns to any pair of elements. Any pair of elements means that this 2 and 3 was a pair from the set of natural numbers, right? That assigns to any pair of elements of S taken in a definite order to an other element of S. Here, in our case, S is N and the pair which they are talking about is 2, 3. This 2, 3 belongs to natural numbers. That part was fine. But we wanted that the number, the third number, which we are getting after applying the operation should also belong to N. However, it is not. This means that we cannot define minus in the set of uh, natural numbers. Okay, We cannot define this binary operation in natural numbers. Right? You'll get a better idea uh, when we will do questions of this topic. But just tell me if you are clear with this part or not. Yes. Okay. Okay. Perfect. So we will. Just... Okay. Excellent. Right. After this, we have a detailed discussion on this part. So let's do it here. Okay, because this topic is very important. Binary operations are important. Based on binary operations, we have groups, monoids, so many things which you have not studied in A-levels, which we don't study in A-levels. We I personally studied that in my bachelor's, right? Okay, now we need to know that whenever we have a binary operation, whenever we have a binary operation like this one, right? We have one, two, three, four, five, six laws. This binary operation should, should satisfy six laws in order to be called binary operation, right? Here, in this part, I just discussed two things. I just said that these two numbers, A and B, should belong to the set S. And the third number, which we are getting, that was minus one, should have been part of this n as well, right? But here we just discussed two numbers. Here in this table, we are going to talk about some of the uh, properties which are important for every binary operation, right? Okay, so let's talk about the first one. Here, we are only talking about the basics, addition and multiplication. We are only talking about these two binary operations, addition, and multiplication. In this case, we just we said that division, subtraction, these can also be binary operations, but now our focus would be on addition and multiplication only. Okay, and this is very easy, trust me. So don't think of it as something which you would not understand. Okay. Right. Now, if you have a binary operation, 
it should satisfy closure law now what is closure law we have already discussed that closure law says okay so this basically is the same table but i have distributed it this way that's why i can write over here so closure law basically means that if you have two numbers which are belonging to your set okay here s that was our set is of real numbers okay and this is the pair this is the pair which is belonging to our set that was of real numbers so for it to be binary operation the thing which was needed is that x staric y the answer of this thing here staric is addition so it would be x plus y should also belong to the set of real numbers okay the set in which we have x and y we should also have x plus y in that set right so are you clear with this for addition Uh, can you repeat it? The engineer to where his where you bad. Okay, okay, I'll repeat. The voice was lagging. Okay, I'll repeat it. Right. So here I'm saying in closure law, it is important for binary operation. Like for an op, we have so many operations in math, but if we want it to be binary op operation, particularly, we need to have uh six. We want our binary operation or that operation to satisfy six laws and then it would be binary operation right so we know what we are discussing the first thing is closure law so let's say if we are talking about addition in real numbers r is the set of real numbers we are saying that if x and y belong to real numbers the third number which we are getting after adding these two numbers should also belong to the set of real this is what closure law says okay but that could be false as well right because some decimals would add up to a natural number or, yeah, or yeah, real yeah, numbers yeah. are the decimals right real numbers every number in math okay very good question again i'll tell you okay this is the part over here like um uh, just give me a second it's, yeah here look set of real numbers it has both rational and irrational numbers okay so in maths every number like um, which you have studied particularly emma because you have not studied complex numbers every number other than complex numbers uh, is real number okay so real number basically has set of rational and irrational numbers okay it includes both decimal numbers and whole numbers it include every integer or even positive negative every number is a real number if it's not a complex number and we are not talking about complex numbers here okay so so far you should know that every number in maths is a real number if it's not a complex number right so to answer okay. your question yes it could be that x is let's say 2.2 and y is let's say uh, 0.8 now if i add these two numbers i'm going to get 3 now this 3 is a whole number these two are decimal numbers that does not matter all these three are real numbers okay yes yes i have a question the uh, in computer science okay in coding okay there are, you know there are uh, types there are types okay and the real the real uh, data type is the is for decimals the boundary okay. of over there of of the real is limited to decimals okay we don't uh, consider uh, what's it called whole numbers or like natural numbers in real numbers we have another data type for it, integer oh, okay 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 i don't know so why that. is that yeah i i obviously i do i have not studied computers so i don't know about that but in maths real numbers include natural numbers all the positive integers negative integers zero decimal numbers whole numbers fractions every number which you have studied so far in your life is a real number okay real number is okay. a very 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 big set and all these small sets like positive integers negative integers odd numbers even numbers all of them all of these sets they belong to real numbers but real numbers in general is a big set okay so like don't uh, mix up things right 
I I'll do some research okay. on that on my end. I'll discuss with you know computer teacher we have, and then I'll let you know if I get time. Okay. Because if I tell you honestly, yeah, I, have, I have no idea about computers mm-hmm. because I did my BSc in maths. So yeah, but but it's good that you are relating things because obviously students might think this way as well that like in one subject we are taking this and in the other subject we're taking things that way. Anyways, yeah. Anyways, okay. Now we are talking about the closure law in case of multiplication, right? Again, um, the set is of real numbers. Right, and if x and y belong to real numbers, if x and y belong to real numbers, here, the important thing is that their product, like when we multiply, because here we're talking about multiplication, when we multiply these two numbers, this answer should also belong to the set of real numbers, and if and if it does, we would say that it satisfies the closure law, right? So I hope this this is clear. The closure law is clear because this is the only thing which, yes. which which is which was different. The rest of the things are what we already you know know. Okay, so we have discussed closure law for addition and multiplication only, and the set which we are talking about um, here was real numbers. So we just said if two numbers, let's say one and two, which belong to real numbers, there's some. That is when we add them, their answer three should also belong to real numbers. It does, and their product, which would be two, should also belong to real numbers. So this is what closure law is: that the product which we get after applying the operation should also belong to the same set. Okay. Now we have associative law. For associative law, in case of addition. This is what we have. Like, if we have x, y, z, three numbers belonging to real numbers, this should hold. This should be equal to x plus y plus z. Like, x plus this number should be equal to this number plus z. Right? So you guys must be familiar with associative law already. If I am not uh, assuming wrong, right? I'm sorry. What was it again? Okay, so basically, somewhere else. Yeah. Okay. So associative law. In addition, if we have three numbers x, y, z, which belong to real numbers, associative law says that this would be equal to this. What is this? Think of x, y, z as three numbers. Let's say one, two, and three. If we have one plus two plus three, that should be equal to one plus two. Plus three, so this is one plus three. Uh, sorry, this is one plus five, and this is three plus three. So both these sides are six, right? So this law holds, right? So this is what they are saying that your binary operation in this case, it would addition, well, should be such that if we uh apply this rule, it should satisfy associative law in short, right? And same holds for multiplication as well. Now we have three numbers x, y, z, which belong to real numbers. The rule says that you are multiplying x with y, z. This should be equal to if you are multiplying it with x, y, and then with z, right? So again, if I have one into two into three, and if I have one into two into three. This would be six, and this would also be six, right? So this is what associative law is. You need to learn these laws, okay? Like this is something which you guys need to learn. It is a property, right? But it's not very difficult. I mean, it's easy. We just have brackets. Here we have bracket for second and third number. Here we have bracket for first and second number. And we know that if we're talking about set of real numbers and addition and multiplication, this law holds, okay? You guys will get a better idea once we do questions as well. Okay, I hope it's clear. Right now, again, we are talking about we are talking about binary operations, and we know that we want these six properties to hold for 
an operation to be a binary operation every operation is not a binary operation multiplication is an operation uh, multiplication is operation division is operation plus minus all these are operations but for it to be a binary operation we have these six properties and we are not saying this randomly we are we are saying binary operations for a set minus is an operation but it cannot be a binary operation in set of natural numbers which i told you because if i take um, i know that 2 and 3 belong to n that part is clear but if i do 2 minus 3 i am getting minus 1 which does not belong to n so although minus is an operation but it is not a binary operation because it is not satisfying this law and this law particularly is what is the name of this law we have just discussed this law this is closure law right this is closure law that the sum or any binary operation here since we were talking about addition particularly but the answer which we are getting after applying the binary operation should belong to our set okay so this holds for addition and multiplication but it does not hold for uh, subtraction and division as well but we are not talking about that here okay so i hope it's clear i hope you know that what exactly we are trying to figure out today we are figuring out that if um, we have so many operations which we have been studying plus minus addition subtraction but which one of these are binary operations and we assign binary operations in sets okay minus is an operation no doubt but it cannot be a binary operation in n because it does not satisfy this closure law i hope it's clear is it clear yes yes okay okay right now we are going to talk about the third law that is identity law just like we said that in our set we need to have the product we need to have this in our set it should satisfy the associative property as well and we have only been talking about addition and sub multiplication so here we have third law which says we need to have the identity element as well okay let's read it now for all x belonging to real numbers this means every number which we have in real numbers which could be 1 which could be 1.1 which could be 1 by 2 which could be 2.6 which could be 3 which could be 4 which could be 7 we have prime numbers positive integers we can have minus 1 we have 0 all these are real numbers okay so let's say we uh, for all x belonging to real numbers like every element in this real numbers okay we have 0 in this set of real numbers as well okay such that x plus 0 equals 0 plus x so this means 0 is the identity element now these definitions are very complicated i know that i'll explain okay identity identity law basically means that in your set in your set here particularly we are talking about r that is the set of real numbers we need to have an identity element okay in the set which is real numbers in this case we need to have our identity element and how are we um defining identity element we are saying identity element is such that when i add my element to that question mark which i don't know what it is going to be so far equals and the order does not matter should be the element itself now i know that this is only possible if i have zero here right so in case of addition zero is my identity element right so i need to have zero in my set just so i can say that addition is a binary operation i hope it's clear is it clear because you guys are seeing this for the first time i know that you would be able to get it that easily but i i, I assume that like 50% would be clear right what i i'll tell you again this x is any element of this real number okay it's any element from this set of real numbers zero is the identity element 
and why is it the identity element because when i'm adding my real number to it i'm getting my real number again so this is what identity element i'll tell you in case of multiplication as well okay now let's say um again we're talking about set of real numbers and x is a real number i need such a number which when i multiply x with i get that element directly now in case of multiplication i know that one is that element i know that one is that number and this only holds for one right i know that if i have one over here and this don't get confused by these two things just give me a second i need to write it this way because by this you know what they are trying to say they are just trying to say that order does not matter right if we have x here or we have x here since it's multiplication since it's, it's addition this is good not going to matter the thing which you need to focus at is this part and this part okay when you are adding your real number to this number you are getting your real number back for addition you know that this number can only be zero so zero is the identity element zero is the identity element and if you talk about one one is the number whenever you multiply a number with one you get that number back so you know that one uh, is your identity element is it clear emma is it clear yes it is great excellent okay now i'll give you a quick quick um, background okay let me just stop this part Okay, so we have been discussing natural numbers, right? We have been discussing natural numbers. This set of natural numbers, which begins with one, two, and so on. And like I told you, this uh, we cannot define subtraction in the set of natural numbers as binary operation because, like, when we got two minus three equals minus one. this does not belong to natural numbers this is why we said that minus is not a binary operation in natural numbers are you clear with this because like uh, the closure property was not being satisfied right okay okay and now if i talk about natural numbers again and addition i need to have the identity element i need to have an element such that whenever i add my natural number to that element i get my natural number back and i know that in case of addition that is only possible when i have zero so zero should belong to the set of natural numbers although it doesn't okay since zero does not belong to set of natural numbers it means i do not have my identity element in n here particularly since we are talking about addition so we call it additive identity here additive identity that is zero does not belong to set of natural numbers so we can say that addition is not a binary operation in natural numbers right did you understand this yes sure Mm -hmm. you can ask me i i wouldn't mind that okay because like i understand you are looking you are seeing all this for the first time so like i am here to teach you you can ask me if you are not able to understand i won't mind telling you again and again okay okay if you insist you can repeat okay <laughs> all right so okay so i am saying we have a set of natural numbers in which we have 1 2 Three and so on, right? When we were talking about the binary operation subtraction, we figured one thing out that subtraction cannot be binary operation in case of natural numbers. Why? Because if I have two natural numbers, let's say two and three, the answer was minus one. This does not belong to n. This means that it. the closure law is not being satisfied okay the closure property is not being satisfied the closure property said that we need to have the answer 
the number the third number which we get after applying the binary operation in our set and this is not true so since it is not satisfying the closure law subtraction is not defined in the set of natural numbers we know that right okay yes. and now i'm saying if i talk about my um binary of op my operation as addition and i need to check if this it is an operation we we do 2 plus 3 5 we do that but we need to see if it is a binary operation or not right so first rule is closure law let's apply that i have two numbers 2 and 3 i am applying the binary operation i get 5 which belongs to the set of natural numbers so it satisfies the closure law and it certainly would satisfy the associative law because it is addition i know if i'm doing 2 plus 3 let's say for the third number this thing and this thing would be same right so like so far closure law is satisfied uh, associative law is satisfied and for this operation to be binary operation i want it to satisfy all these six okay it should satisfy identity law inverse property and all those which will be studying in future it should also satisfy those as well okay now if i talk about if we talk about the identity law so we need to have let's say talk about 2 plus something and as a result i should get 2 again okay so in general for identity law we write x plus identity element and we get x bar here i am writing down 2 particularly for your reference now emad i need a number such that when i add 2 with it i get 2 back and we know that number is zero only right zero is zero only yeah. but but zero does not belong to the set of natural numbers look we do not have zero here we it is starting from 1 2 3 and so on since zero does not belong to set of natural numbers which means we do not have the uh, additive identity in n which means that it is not satisfying the identity law which means that addition is not binary operation in set of natural numbers right plus minus multiplication division all these are operations we know that here the discussion is going on on binary operation for an operation to be binary operation we want it to satisfy the six properties so far we have just discussed three so far we have discussed closure law associative law and the fact that it should have identity as well okay if our set in this case natural numbers zero does not belong to natural numbers so this certainly means that we cannot have a uh, identity law like an identity law is not being satisfied here so this means that this is not a binary operation is it clear now yes okay okay let's talk about But, yeah yes mm no nothing No, ask me, please ask me. It's okay. You have to ask. Me. Okay. Then, um. So, uh, in addition, then mm -hmm. how will we get the same answer? If zero is not a natural number, then it's not an operation. Exactly. Then it's not identity law. Exactly. Then how will we get the same number? Exactly. In addition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, like we get same when we are doing when we are. uh doing this in maths right we write two because like this is an operation this is going to hold this is not something at that time we don't say that we're talking about natural numbers we're talking about this would not hold in natural numbers this does not hold in natural numbers okay i was just trying to tell you that this should have been the case this is what we need for um identity elements but since zero does not belong to n 
so yes you can say that this is not true but like we don't write it this way all we say is that this should have been the case this should have been the case right this should have been the case this this is what we wanted but since this element does not 2 plus 0 is true this is true 2 plus 0 is true you cannot say that 2 plus 0 is not true no the thing is that 0 does not belong to n that is why it is not true it is going to be true in case of integers if i talk about set of integers here i was just giving you with this as an example okay if i talk about set of integers in integers we have all the negative integers we have zero we have all the positive integers and so on right now let's talk about it let's let's uh, okay let's talk about addition as our binary operation or maybe addition is an operation in the beginning and let's see if it is binary operation or not okay let's begin okay this is our first example like i had i already planned these examples but once we were done with all these copies okay but let's do it now okay so we want to see that although addition is an operation i know that if i do 1 plus 2 i get 3 we have been doing this fine at that time we were just talking about addition as an operation okay like we do get our answers and that is an operation but here we are saying if it is binary operation or not right okay first law what was the first law first law was uh, here it is closure law okay let's see if it satisfies closure law or not okay so we are talking about the closure law we have two elements let's say a and b which belong to the set of integers now these a and b uh, could be minus 2 1 minus 3 3 1 2 0 1 -2 -1 any two integers from the set z okay when i say any it means any okay and the closure law says when i apply my operation that in this case it is addition the answer should also belong to z and it certainly does let's say you take two negative integers minus 3 and minus 2 you get minus 5 you have minus 5 in z you take 0 and minus 2 you are going to get minus 2 which belongs to z okay so on and so forth you can take any two numbers which belong to the set right here and their answer would belong to set of uh, integers okay so far we know that the operation addition satisfies the closure law for it to be a binary operation it has to satisfy all the six laws we have okay okay amit so it satisfies closure law next law is associative law associative law says we okay let's go and have a look at associative law again look we are done with closure law we have associative law now so it says x plus y plus z and x plus y plus z should be equal okay so we have x y z these three numbers belong to the set of integers these three numbers belong to the set right here and x plus y plus z equals x plus y plus z now you can take any three numbers from the set of integers and you will certainly see that this property holds okay like in exam in net in life in maths you are not supposed to like you know check it for every option this is something which you will know uh, as soon as you practice more questions you will know that like if all these three numbers belong to the set of integers this is what you are going to have okay 
So associative law is also satisfied, right? Emma? Yes. The third law is identity law. Identity law. And what is this law? So we say that let's say X belongs to Z. Okay, this sign means belong. And this means for all. Okay, this um, this A, it's uh, an A upside down. This upside down A basically means for all X belonging to Z. So in English, it would mean for every element of Z, if you do this, X plus zero equals zero plus X, you are going to get X, okay? This is the identity law which should be satisfied and this number right here, which is zero, should belong to your set. In this case, we have integers. Here clearly, zero belongs to the set of integers. We do have zero. So identity law is also satisfied, okay? So, so far it looks like addition might be a binary operation instead of integers, but we are not sure because we need to study um, these properties as well, okay? So are you clear till that part? Yes. Sure? 100%. Excellent, okay, perfect. So, okay. Now we have to talk about the fourth property, which is inverse property. Okay, let's do it. And I repeat, it is new, but it is not difficult, okay? Like, if I tell you honestly, when I was doing my BSc, my classmates were had FSC background, and I, was, um, I had an OE levels background as well. So initially, I used to think of these things as, you know, like this is very complicated and I would never understand, but it's not like that. It is very easy. It is something which we have been doing, but we don't name things in A-level. We don't define things. We just focus on concepts, right. practice. And in FSC, uh, which is another, um, you know, system in Pakistan, here they basically focus on properties, definitions, and, you know, rote memorization. So yeah, this is why at times, A-level students get offended while preparing for entry tests. Okay, but that's okay. Right. So, I have to drop this because we're going to talk about the inverse property. So, so far, we have discussed three properties. Here, we are going to talk about the fourth one. That is the inverse property. Okay, so in this case, what we have is for all X belonging to R. Now again, Emma, here they are talking about set of real numbers. Okay, here their S is real numbers. But when we do examples, we can have real numbers, we can have uh, integers, we can have natural numbers, we can have anything, okay? So here, what they're trying to say is that addition operation is going to satisfy inverse property if, for all x belonging to R, that is if every element of set R has an element which is minus x belonging to R such that, they have defined this minus x such that when you add that this element to this element, you get zero. Okay. So if you look at the definition, it looks very complicated, but it is not. Okay. I'll tell you. Think of, um, again, think of uh, integers. Okay, so, so far we got that the set of integers and if we talk about addition in it, it satisfies these three laws. And here we have the fourth law that is inverse property. Let's see if integers satisfy this property or the don't. Okay, so set was of integers and operation was addition. Okay, so what is the rule? So we will say that for all X belonging to Z, which means that for every element of Z, Z had negative integers, zero, positive integers, and so on, right? For every element that belongs to the set Z, 
we need to have an element minus x belonging to z such that when i do this i get zero okay this basically means that let's say i have 2 and i have minus 2 as well i get zero i get my identity element okay so this property means that this is the part which we need to focus at for every element x let's say if you have 1 2 3 in a set you need to have minus 1 minus 2 minus 3 in that set just so when you add it when you add it you get zero okay is this thing clear okay yes okay now i'll tell you here we are talking about integer okay if i take the set of positive integers particularly now this set is going to have plus 1 plus 2 plus 3 so on now if i say for an now here i am particularly talking about the inverse property okay okay now if i say for all x belonging to z positive we need minus x is as well which belong to the set in order to satisfy the inverse property but i know that i do not have minus 1 i do not have minus 2 i do not have minus 3 these do not belong to the set of positive integers so this set of positive integers will not satisfy the inverse property because it does not have the uh, inverses of these elements so it is not going to be a binary operation in this set okay is it clear yes so like we have to write plus sign for it to specify that all of the numbers are positive integers in this z yeah i just told right? the, I, I, yes 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 in in this z in this z look we discussed this in the okay. very beginning i told you oh sorry it's on this one look positive integers okay. we have 1 2 3 it's not necessary to write like this way i was just trying to you know emphasize on the fact that we only have positive right Okay, you'll get to know everything okay. very well. Don't don't worry at all. You'll do good job in any day. Okay, don't worry. Okay, and we'll not do uh, we'll not do everything today. We'll just do till here. I'll revise and then you're good to go. All you need to do is throughout the like weekdays, just revise all this. On the weekend, we will finish this part right, and then we'll practice questions and you will master that. So just don't worry. Okay. right now we have discussed for addition okay for multiplication it is similar for multiplication it says for all x belonging to r which means for every element in the set of real numbers this cross set for a moment this is just to you know it's a condition i'll, I'll tell you we need to have 1 by x such that when you multiply your element with 1 by x you get 1 now do you see that this is your additive identity right zero is the identity element in addition so another word of another way of saying this long sentence is identity element of addition we call it additive identity okay so zero is additive additive identity yes identity. yeah <clears throat> okay and one is multiplicative identity okay it's okay multiplicative identity okay so right so now you know now you know that for satisfying the inverse property in any set here they are talking about um, real numbers okay and the operation is addition in the first column and it is multiplication in this column which i am rubbing okay you need to have inverses and how have they defined their inverses additive inverse would be 
a number of this type such that when you add it to this number, you get additive identity that is zero. Okay, think of it as zero. Don't say additive identity, that might confuse you. And here in this column, you know that you need to have a number one by x. That one by x is basically your multiplicative inverse. Okay. This one by x is your multiplicative inverse such that when you multiply it with your element, you get one. Okay. You'll get idea after this example. Okay. It's just the last example for today. Then you just have to, you know, revise everything just so things are clear. Okay. Where are you getting all of this content? Is there any specific book or if you're combined? Like, yeah, no, we basically, um, we basically, I made this content using different past paper, um, past papers and interest books because like our course is designed for every university we don't do it for nas slums fast particularly because like students they don't apply in one university they apply in you know right. multiple universities so this is a combined um, type of syllabus okay all right so it's for me nest is the only option otherwise i'll go out yeah i know that but yes this has everything which would be required for any group. Yeah. So you can check that on their website as yeah, well. You can yes. get the same content. So don't worry about that. Okay. Right. Okay. Now um I'll discuss that in detail after this. Okay. Once the recording is stopped, I'll discuss all that as well in detail. This for now last this this is discuss the last thing. Now think of the set of integers which has like you know we have so many elements all the negative integers then you have zero then you have um, positive integers and this time our operation is not addition our operation is multiplication okay our operation is multiplication okay now quickly let's check out on closure law if i have two elements which belong to the set of integers and I am multiplying these two elements and I get the third element, whatever element I get, it should belong to the set of integers and it does. Think of A as three, think of B as minus two, you will get minus six, you have negative integers, right? Like you will get, sorry, you will get minus six. This is minus six and it belongs to the set of integers okay you have any two positive integers that is going to be a positive integer you are going to get that as well you multiply it with zero you get zero you have that as well okay so the closure property is satisfied okay here initially we think of multiplication as an operation and if it satisfies the six properties it would be a binary operation okay perfect so like it satisfies the closure law right uh, Mehmet, if we talk about associative law quickly, what we have is mm -hmm. ABC equals, let me write it down properly. We, we write it this way, okay? So we have ABC belonging to the set of integers. And the condition is that ABC equals ABC, right? Like this way. You multiply this and this, then and this and this. So you know that that in case of integers, this would be satisfied, right? Are you clear with this as well? Yes. Excellent. Now we talk about the additive law. So if A is any number that belongs to Z, sorry, sorry, um, multi, uh, identity law in case of multiplication, okay? So A is any number which belongs to Z, you need, one just so when you multiply your a with one you get a back and you know that one belongs to the set of integers 
right here okay so this part is also satisfied okay so so far okay. so far we have that three of the properties are being like they are satisfied so this operation of multiplication might be a binary operation in case of integer okay but you'll get to know that shortly if it is on or, or if it isn't okay now we have fourth property one two three fourth is inverse property let's call it inverse property okay and for and this is the inverse property so for every x for all x belonging to z and don't worry about this all and this belongs at the end you will be solving mcqs okay this is just for your understanding right now you're just focusing on the content even if you don't understand these notations it's completely fine okay don't spend time on learning this because like in mcqs uh, they are not going to talk about notations i mean they would but obviously when you see notations time and again you will get a better idea about them okay so don't worry about these notations i know that you might not be familiar with these because like when i was in a level i did not know about this symbol right here okay anyways so we are talking about the inverse law which basically says that for all elements belonging to z we need to have an element such that it is 1 by a which should also belong to z such that we have x 1 by x 1 by x so a a a a and this should be 1 okay i've simply written this part which i'm rubbing now i know that i am talking about the set of integers and i do not have 1 by a in integers right like this should have been the case but since 1 by a does not belong to z i have 1 2 3 so on belonging to z but i do not have 1 by 2 i do not have 1 by 3 uh, belonging to z although i have 1 by 1 i have 1 by 1 i have 0 by 1 like I do have some inverses, but I need to have for every A, for every element of Z, that includes all the negative integers, zero positive integers. For all these elements, I need to have my multiplicative inverse. That is a fraction of this type, which has one by A, right? And I know in case of integers, I do not have fractions. I just have positive whole numbers. Since I do not have multiplicative inverses in Z, this does not satisfy the inverse property, which means that we can not define multiplication as a binary operation in integers, right? Is this clear? Yes. Sure? Yes. Okay. So I'll stop the recording and then you can ask me if you have any questions.